All right, well, we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Joanne Gear. I am the executive director for the Westchester Biotech Project. I'm going to introduce my co-founder, Michael Welling, to say a few words, and I will. It'll take me a minute to get to the slide, so you can start talking, Michael, and and you'll see what comes up. No worries. Well, first of all, welcome, everyone. I hope you are all healthy and comfortable and well. Um, we truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to sort of join us and participate uh, in what is clearly going to be a, a really interesting uh, and, and exciting conversation. Um, the Westchester Biotech Project truly was founded on the notion of the time has come to push forward in bringing smart, like-minded people together to try and force the conversations that we all can benefit from. Uh, and I really believe that this idea about the patient-centric clinical trial concept truly speaks to that idea. Uh, having come from a world not as a scientist or a researcher, but where my, my now 14-year-old son was the recipient of some truly cutting-edge medical science and, and treatment, I, I know how much uh, or how far we still can go uh, in, in focusing uh, the world of research, where, as I say, the art of medicine meets the, the medical science. Uh, we, we spend most of our time, like today, bringing together researchers, data scientists, and engineers. Uh, these are the folks that we really uh, focus in on as being the engine that drives all of the collaboration and discovery. Uh, and while we may have Westchester in our name, uh, for those of you who have participated before, uh, that in no way limits us to the Westchester region. In fact, it's the opposite. We are simply trying to create a, a unified voice of the Westchester community to allow them to better collaborate uh, amongst the, the international community. And obviously the work that we're doing, uh, mainly by Joanne, I, I just show up for jokes and entertainment, uh, could not be possible without all the tremendous support and contributions from the endless numbers of supporters, both individual and, and, and organizations, um, individuals, you, you will hear from some today, you've already been introduced. From an organization standpoint, you can see here, this isn't even in the entire sort of community that we deal with, but it represents a, a wide spectrum of researchers, academia, municipalities, business people. The unique thing about everyone listed on this this slide, and quite frankly, everyone attending today, is that shared understanding and vision of how we need to move forward and, and the best path forward. So a huge thank you to everyone on the screen, not included on this screen, and, and participating today to help us accomplish that. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, so welcome everybody. I know a couple more people came in. That was Michael Welling. It's the co-founder of the Westchester Biotech Project. I'm Joanne Gear, the other co-founder. Um, and we're going to hear today, so first of all, this is being recorded and uh, we are likely to post the video. We uh, think it's gonna probably be valuable. If anything really crazy happens, we'll cut it out, but you should feel comfortable to speak, but to know that you may be posted. Um, we are going to hear from our speakers first, and then we have a nice long time for discussion. So uh, you certainly can use the chat function, but we'll we'll look at it later. Uh, but and you're be, you'll be welcome to uh, join the conversation as we move along. Uh, we're going to first hear from uh, Daria Crean first, and then Ellen Bedenko who are the co-chairs of our clinical research cohort. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Lori Halloran and then Darshan Kolkarni. Welcome, Darshan. Good to see you there. And uh, <laughs> you got me a little excited, but I think everything, <laughs> it's all good. We're all here. You gotta, it, I like that shirt. That's nice. <laughs> um, and uh, so I am going to move ahead with Daria. Uh, so I think everybody knows the drill to keep yourselves muted unless you're speaking. Um, and uh, here we go. Daria. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Daria. Um, I've been involved uh, with the bio pro Westchester Bio Project since about February. Um, it's a long story how I even got involved, 
but they had a wonderful breakfast up in New York and in Westchester. And I attended that and just met some wonderful people, including Joanne. And the collaboration in this community has just really been inspiring. And I love hearing from all the different specific um, areas of expertise and how we all come together in learning from each other um, in a very informal ma matter. So um, being involved in this has really been not what I consider work, but fun. And um, Joanne, Ellen, and myself have had these informal discussions on what we can talk about next, what the community might want to hear about, and what's really happening right now. And being a nurse, I think I am very passionate, or not think, I am very passionate about this truly patient-centric future that we have coming in with virtual clinical trials and where this is leading and how we are going to get there. So we have some great speakers today that I'm just thrilled to have. And um, we were able to get, thanks to Joanne. And I think it's just gonna be a good, good discussion. I just have a few basic slides to talk about, and that's just kind of introducing the concept of what we're gonna be um, addressing and discussing today. Okay. So just to kind of give a basic overview of virtual versus remote versus traditional, or in this particular side, also addressed as clinic. You know, you'll see how uh, with virtual, remote, and clinic, the first word you see is interaction. And, you know, it's interesting because the definition of interaction is a direct Im involvement with someone or something. And that's exactly what patient centricity is. It's a direct Im involvement and engagement with the patient. And that's really where we need to be heading. It sounds very simplistic, but it actually has become extremely complex. Um, so as you see virtual, you know, is a different way of incorporating different ways of technology that where clinical research can really advance, where it is less of a patient bur burden and more of a patient focus. So not to get into any of those intricate details of the technology piece, but just to kind of put that out there that again, this is leaning towards patient centricity. You know, remote away from the clinical area, coming to the patient in their home, just like kind of basic home care, uh, uh, nursing that's been around for years, going to the patient and letting that burden be lessened by them coming traditionally to the different sites, whether it be a hospital, a clinic, a physician's office, an institution. And this has really, you know, come more to the front line with COVID and how patients do not want to go to these specific areas, especially with these uh, comorbidities that they might have. Um, so just to kind of give you an overview of where we are with this right now and where hopefully it will be heading in a positive direction for patient outcomes. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. You know, I put this in here just because um, patient centricity and virtual clinical trials is not necessarily new to research. I don't know how far it actually goes back. But my point to putting this slide in is how it was virtual, but it was not patient centric. So it was a Pfizer um, trial, one of their first that they tried um, that was virtual. And it involved most of the elderly. It was a urinary bladder trial. And why it failed was because it was a lack of education and training on these electronic tools. It incorporated the uh, older population, elderly population, and they just didn't get what they had to do with this technology they were given to complete the trial. So again, it's a, 
another example of where we need to go to really put patient centricity on the front line. A lot of new, I mean, a lot of um, consistent education and training with our patients in these clinical trials to make them successful. Okay, thanks, Joanne. So this, this is more introducing what um, I think our speakers will be addressing um, and how it is a new model. And it's a new model because it's addressing true patient centricity and really looking at other strategies and innovations on how we can change this and not to continue to use the same traditional methodologies. So patient centricity, decentralization, lessening that patient burning, uh, burden, changing from not what we can have, but what we must have for our patients and how clinical research will advance um, to positive patient outcomes with that. Um, a big question I have, and I think uh, any articles that I've read or even white papers is, <clears throat> patient centricity is not new, new to anyone in our industry, especially since COVID, but what are the resources? Do we truly have the resources to provide that? And then the different challenges that we do come up about uh, against, um, lack of clinical op, um, operation innovation expertise, not being afraid to change and really truly decentralize. And, um, you know, of course our regulatory regulations and digital uh, technology challenges that we come up against. So I'm just going to move this forward to Ellen, um, who I worked with um, on a clinical trial and um, we've been friends for a long time and professional um, uh, advocates to each other for many years. So I'm going to introduce Ellen and she has a few slides she'd like to talk about as well. Um, thank you, Daria. And thank you very much for introducing me to Westchester Biotech Project. Um, so I don't have any slides. I only have a couple of remarks. Um, I'm a registered nurse and a clinical research coordinator. And for years, I guess, scratch that for decades. Uh, research professionals at sites have been very frustrated that we were not able to make study participation easier for the patients or potential participants because of, um, I guess what I call the logistics of life, transportation, childcare, people unable to take off work to come for study visits, and uh, over the past, um, I would say, uh, five years, I've seen that the clinical research enterprise has been really moving in the right direction, but this being 2020, the push came to shove. So um, as a professional whose focus is uh, on recruitment and retention and, uh, you know, uh, basically patient participation in clinical trials and also how to make things easier for uh, for the sponsors and for investigators to perform the trials. Um, I feel that actually us having the conversation about virtual clinical trials and uh, having the virtual clinical trials, uh, hybrid trials in the forefront of the, um, of, on the conversations of the clinical research community, it feels like a pinch me moment um, because um, I truly believe that uh, and very hopeful that having discussion like our round table today uh, will help advance clinical trials to a truly new level. And ultimately making the journey of clinical trials participation easier for people from all geographic locations, from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, um, people with disability, people with limited English proficiency. I really hope that we can do it. And this is the, this is one of the little steps towards that. And I'm really looking forward to um, hearing the presentations and to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. So Lori, if you're ready, you can share your screen and proceed. Okay.
So um, patient centricity is not necessarily new. Patient centricity in a virtual program is newer, but hybrid trials where we actually used a telephone has been around for 20 years or more. Um, what I what I would like to say is that you know I've I've been I've been pulled into a lot of discussions um, and it, the the evolution of what I'm hearing is changing daily. And I happen to have had a, a, a prep call, oh, sorry, I've had a prep call with uh, several people that I am doing a panel with at the Magi conference um, on November either 9th or 10th. Um, and they represent large institutions, patient representatives and Merck. So it really is informing what I'm going to say, and it's also evolving in real time. So, mm -hmm. so anything you hear about is a, a little bit of a work in progress. However, there has been a lot of, I've just got to figure out how to share. Yeah, there has been a lot of, of activity, which is really um, encouraging. So, you know, the pandemic, as you all know, has really ramped this up. Um, the, you know, the sponsors that we have worked with, and, and actually I'll take one minute to just talk about what we do so that everybody understands where, where our position is. Um, we provide, as a consulting team, we provide drug development expertise at a mid to senior level for about 100, 100 programs at any given time. Right now we have over 215 programs going on, so we're we're really, really busy. And so we're kind of in it, in the middle of it from the sponsor side on a daily basis, which gives us a really interesting vantage. Um, what happened in mid-March was, you know, as you all know, unprecedented, and I get sick of hearing that word all the time, but it really truly was. Um, and what, what sponsors immediately did was try to take a step back and figure out how they could just continue especially when patients had life-threatening illnesses for which they were potentially saving, uh, receiving um, treatment that you know, was going to prolong or, or um, improve their lives. So what, what really what we ended up doing is um, looking at how we could just ensure that patient safety was kept with anything that could be done re remotely or virtually, thinking about how to look differently at risks and communicating almost immediately with the regulatory authorities about how we could adopt things as quickly as possible, even though they weren't necessarily validated and accepted and all of that kind of stuff. So these are these were our top priorities as we as we started in this. And I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between the pandemic because obviously we all see an opportunity with the pandemic to make this more real. Um, my goal or my hope is that we don't backslide as as sponsor representatives. So in in a you know on a high level, patient centric drug development is different than virtual trials, but they can be blended so that they can be more virtual or more hybrid, as as uh, I think Ellen said. Um, what what you really have to be doing, and this is a little bit novel to a lot of pharma companies you have to incorporate the patient's voice in the development of medicines. You have to study whether, obviously whether the, you know, during the study, whether the medicines are safe and effective and whether the benefits of, of, of taking the medicine outweigh the risk. But it's not that long ago that we actually started including patients and their caregivers in discussions about how to do this. So whenever you can do that on a more formalized basis, you, you end up, and this is probably not going to be obvious to the research sites who deal with patients on an ongoing basis, but patients are two steps or three steps away from the sponsors who are designing the protocol. So it isn't an automatic. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit about, oh, wow, we should be thinking about this moment, because, um, which has only been made more acute by the pandemic. So in, in, in one of the senior people on my team has spent the last several years doing patient-centric workshops. Um, so she, I got input from her on how she's been doing this and can share these slides for anyone who's interested. 
but you're, you're looking at the patients, you're looking at the caregivers, coordinators, investigators, payers, regulatory representatives, and then the team themselves. Um, and, and increasingly you have de technology development partners who are kind of clamoring at the door to be part of this conversation. But the way you do it has to be a, a, a little bit of a formalized process in the protocol development phase or the program development phase where you, and, and this is actually happening in some uh, pharma companies, biotech companies, where they're having either an advisory panel, they're doing workshops. Um, my colleague, Jen, who works with us is doing large workshops with patients as, me as members and sometimes even with regulatory authorities as members of those workshops. Um, to help the study development team determine the best way to define the protocol, define eligibility, and then make it useful and valuable for the patients without being burdensome. There is some effort to do it via social media, um, but there are, there are um, areas where I would, I would say you step into a place where it's not advisable to use social media because, uh-oh, because you run the risk of having patients unblind themselves and then that um, impacts the integrity of the study. Um, one thing I will say, if you bring on an advisory board, sometimes you can utilize a patient advocacy group, but there's almost always a fees involved in that. And if you have a professional patient who's an advisor, you should be expecting to pay fees to, to get their advice. Um, the outcomes, and the, you know, I, it's a short, short time to talk, but the outcomes from the design sessions are valuable, really valuable, and worth taking the time to do. I've listed them here. Um, they're really dependent on the type of program, the level of involvement um, where the patient must be in like an infusion center or something like that, and then combined with the evolution of the technology so that it can be used and, and can be, um, the patients can be trained on how to use them and monitored on how to use them so that the readings are valid. Because the last thing you wanna do is to have any um, programs done where the, the treatments have not been validated. So they are therefore not useful in a later stage tr trial. And this is a moving landscape as well. Um, I think I only have one or two more slides. Um, the real challenges to, to understand is you have to up, up front identify whether or not the FDA will accept it. And the more of a validated endpoints, the more likely they are to be acceptable. But what I, um, what I elicited from Andy Lee, who runs the clinical development organization at Merck, is he has seen that there is not always 100% alliance between the, the, re the reviewer that's accepting the protocol at FDA and the inspectors that do the, the pre-approval inspection. So that's a key thing to look for. Um, there's often a heavy investment in getting the technology up and running. And so what I have seen is a lot of heads of clinical development don't understand really how to do that, that business case and, the, and to define the value that the technology will bring. So that's another key factor that you have to think think about if you work in a, in a pharma or biotech company. Um, you have to make sure that the technology is going to be around, that it's not a, a little bit of a fly-by-night and it's not going to get, you know, kind of sidelined because they run out of cash. And then there really has to be a lot of training that, that goes on across the board. Um, you saw the example where the Pfizer study back in 2011 failed. I don't know if any of you have tried to get your mothers to get on Zoom but if your mother can't get on Zoom, that's the level of education that, I mean, I have trouble every single time. She can't get the microphone to work. So a lot of this is, is not gonna be an automatic thing. You have, to, you have to factor all of this in in the planning and factor in all of the, even the clinical operations people within the pharma company who don't really understand it, so they'd rather not go there. So that's another factor that I see constantly. Um, what I also have seen in the, in the programs that we're doing right now, because this is getting active adoption, um, it has to come from the top. And, and actually that's the CEO level. Um, a lot of chief medical officers are very risk averse. 
So you really need buy-in from the CEO. Um, that means that you don't need a business case because the CEO sees the value and will make the investment. Um, what you also really need to do is assess the, the solutions and design the right solutions so that you can deploy them appropriately. And so this is really, uh, um, it's a now, it's a now uh, activity, but it's also thinking about the future. And we've never been in a better time to do this because as we go back into the fall and we start to surge, there's a lot of willingness to look at this. Um, what you really have to do is look at it as a separate project within a bio, if, if I, I don't know who, who's here, but um, I'm assuming there are some biotech companies. It's a separate project. It's a separate set of expertises that you have to have. It's digital strategies, it's technology adoption. And that often does not exist um, in great wealth within a clinical development team, within a biotech company. I suspect it's also the same as, as um, the research sites. If this is all really new and you want to have the right people on the team, even if you're just renting them to make sure that they're asking the right questions. Another really quick thing, and I, again, I'll share these. You, you can't start off with 100% virtual. You and, the, and the way to, I would recommend you do this is do it step by step. The first one um, is really looking at um, remote monitoring and some remote activities, because you have, as a sponsor, you have to be thinking about how you're going to manage the risk and how you're going to do risk-based quality management um, before you go patient-centric um, and really virtual. Because you really, as the sponsor, you have to make sure that the data that you're going to be paying the sites to, to generate and paying the patients to generate is going to be useful. Um, so again, I, I will make a little plug, and this is for any of you who wish to join. We do um, monthly um, breakfasts where we have companies that, um, biotech companies that want to talk about these things. They can come and they can talk amongst themselves and they can learn from each other. And anyone who's interested, you can reach out. Um, Joanne, if you, you can share my email and we can get them organized to come. We have some local companies here who have really used the pandemic to make fairly significant strides in doing this and, and build in some internal capabilities to do that risk-based quality management within their own organizations without changing outsourcing at all, um, but by building dashboards that they can manage um, what's going on. So it, it, more, the more you learn, the more you, the more you can make changes on your own. And this is what it could be. I think, I think we'll all get there at some point, but a lot of it really has to come down to the level of risk um, and the level of innovation as a culture within your organization. Um, one thing I will say is that ultimately this, this can replace a lot of the work that's on-site monitoring. On-site monitoring has gone in many cases virtual, and this is from what a lot of what the work is that CROs do. So several of the leading and large CROs are starting to look at this very carefully and are taking a lot of virtual um, approaches. Um, I, I, you hear, you will hear about them. Science thirty, not Science thirty seven. Uh, Acuvia. Um, I was quoted that they, you know, in the last six months, they've started to take virtual approaches for uh, close to fifty percent of their trial. And I, I also saw a press release last week that Covance has decided to create a virtual trial unit. So it's a, it's kind of almost a full time job just to keep up with what's going on in all this. And that's my, that's my little overview, which hopefully will generate a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. Well, thank you. That's fantastic. Yes. And we will make the slides available. Thank you. We'll make a PDF and share that. And we will certainly be happy to uh, share your contact information for the, that breakfast. That sounds terrific. Uh, Darshan Kukarni, hello there. Would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? And what are you thinking? Um, so, hey everyone, my name is Darshan Kulkarni. I am, um, by, by background, I'm an attorney, but I'm also, I've, uh, I've been a pharmacist for over 20 years, so I've often been the only unblinded party in clinical trials, so it's always a, a, a fun experience, if you will. Um, I, my, my last position, um, I did a lot of consulting around patient-centric clinical trials and sort of the, the 
edges of what that lands up uh, implicating as well. So I'll talk about that. Um, but but the focus of today's talk was um, patients developing a patient-centric clinical trial and, and what does that sort of look like overall. The, the key piece that I think, and, and I think that uh, uh, we, we just had Lori talk about this in, in, in really good uh, detail, so I'm not going to go over too much of what Lori got into. Um, so I'm going to talk about things that um, that she sort of tangentially mentioned, and I'm happy to answer questions as well. I already have Richard, who's asking questions about uh, use of AI, so I'll, I'll briefly talk about that as well. Um, and and I, I love when I am speaking, the ambulances start going by, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, but I, I think uh, one of the references that was made was talking about um, Pfizer's um, clinical trial, which at that time was really, really important. So I um, hate to make a plug, but I'm going to do that because it's relevant here. Uh, the, the person who often oversaw that was uh, Craig Lipset. So I'm going to be doing a podcast with him and a few others on my podcast. Uh, so if you guys want to follow me, uh, it's Darshan Talk, so you can find that all over LinkedIn and most podcast places. But, but the key pieces that um, I want to start thinking about is, is really when, when we get into virtual clinical trials, one of the things you start thinking about is, um, and, and Lori mentioned this, talking about patient-reported outcomes. And 27% uh, of the 26,000 studies between 2007 and 2013 included uh, patient-reported outcomes. So we're, we've been talking about going into patient-centric studies for a while. The, um, there is what I refer to as the holy quad of patient-centric behavior. And to me, that comes in four major points, which is privacy, transparency, innovation, and access. And when you're talking about those four quads, the reason I call it the holy quad is because your ideals reach 100% of every one of them. But the truth is that as you start increasing on one, you often impact the other. So an example of that is if you're really developing a true patient-centric clinical trial, you really want to preserve the privacy of the patients or the subjects involved in the study. And uh, we can get into the whole argument around are they patients or subjects another time. But the, the, the question, the, the, uh, the consideration is, if you truly believe in privacy, that's great. However, at the same time, patients are clamoring for transparency. What happened to the study I participated in? Um, what happened? Do, can I understand the results of that study? Similarly, if you're spending a lot of time trying to make sure that uh, your, your study and the results from it are innovative, so you're, you're taking a lot of risk, that often implicates the price. And, and when, when you're developing these studies, that might eventually um, disrupt the ability for patients to access the treatments you're, you're developing. So keep that in mind as you're trying to uh, enhance your patient-centric behavior. Um, we, Lori spoke about uh, patient-centric centric study design and remote reporting, so I'm not going to get into that uh, too much in detail, but the, the, uh, outside just making a mention of it. But the other things I want to start thinking about is, we, we spoke about transparency a few seconds ago. Um, when you start thinking about um, what that could look like, there are, there are at least six different forms of it. Um, I work with a lot of large companies who land up asking me to help them with transparency, but the key pieces of that is when you look at um, the, the European, uh, the EMEA, if you will, um, they have come out and, and said that we want you to make sure that the study results are accessible to patients. And that often comes in the form of what, what are called lay summaries. Some of you guys who may be uh, medical writers may have heard of that before. Uh, essentially, what they want to do is, if you're going to publish in New England Journal of Medicine, if you want to publish in, in these other big journals, well, isn't it important that the patient's uh, who participate in the study can actually understand it. That's true patient-centric behavior. Trying to think about your study from soup to nuts and making sure that it is understandable and accessible. Um, and people sort of think, oh, you know what? It's EMA, doesn't apply to me. I don't have to worry about it. Um, except maybe you do. Uh, for example, NIH said that uh, it's crucial that scientific scientists become knowledgeable about how to reach and communicate in their communities before and after trial. Well, that's great, right? It's just the NIH, except there's a declaration of Helsinki, which says that researchers have a duty to make publicly available the results of their research on human subjects 
and are accountable for the completeness and accuracy of their reports. So we've been depending on pharma to do it. Declaration of Helsinki puts the onus on the actual researchers, which in many cases might be the PI, the sub I, or the like. Um, medical journals are expecting you to put this information out there in a way that's understandable to patients. Patients are actually coming out and saying, okay, you know what? I'm helping you developing, develop this clinical trial. Do I get to be one of the authors in the end? So what does that look like if you're developing a truly patient-centric organization that looks at clinical trials in a patient-centric way? Um, and then there, there are obviously reimbursement issues. As anyone who's participated in clinical trials knows, uh, typical pharma reimbursement is 60 to 90 days. Well, patients can't wait that long. What does that even look like when you've got to change the way uh, you're going to manage that? Laurie talked about how Merck is doing it, and a lot of other companies are changing the way they reimburse patients. Um, so that's something else to think about. Um, the other thing, the, what I also want to talk about, and this is this, just the joy of being a lawyer and being a little bit of a wet blanket, if you will, um, but, but the key piece to start thinking about is um, what are the limitations? What are the things that are pulling us back from truly executing on, um, on clinical trials in a patient-centric way? Number one, and Lori hinted at this, uh, evolving regulatory processes. And when I say regulatory, I'm, I'm sort of combining legal and regulatory, but the e-consent regulations aren't really super clear yet. We're talking about, we've been talking about centralized monitoring forever, but this is truly the first time COVID's given us a true opportunity to really get into that. And the FDA is really getting its hands dirty with what that looks like. Um, you've got telemedicine rules uh, that are being perfected as we speak. It was one of those things that was eventually going to become um, something we do, except now with COVID, um, we're doing studies with that and telemedicine is a key component of that. And if you're looking at anything around the mergers and acquisition space, telemedicine is just blowing up. And then um, we, I mentioned this before, but privacy. If you're talking about global studies, you need to start thinking about GDPR. You need to start thinking about the Indian privacy law. You need to th start thinking about Chinese privacy law. You need to start thinking about Israel. You need to start thinking about Brazil. Uh, Health Canada has its own version. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I guess health, not technically Health Canada. Vanessa's law said be Canada itself has its own version. Um, and then you've got um, in the US itself, you've got HIPAA. Well, we're all kind of used to HIPAA, but then you've got CCPA, which comes out of it. And the new one, CCPA is literally like a year old. And California is already going, you know what? I'm already bored. I want something new. And they're looking at CPRA, which, which really looks at reimbursing patients for their data. So, what does that look like in the future? Um, the other things, again, when I, when I work with a lot of these large pharma companies and helping them develop these, um, these patient-centric processes, here are some of the things I have noticed um, overall. And the, these risk your ability to actually engage in true patient-centric behavior. Um, you get a lot of lip service without the actual internal buy-in. And Lori mentioned that when she said that uh, you're getting a lot of, um, if, if you don't get the right people in the room, if you've got the CEO in the room, you're getting actual buy-in. But when you start going lower and lower down the totem pole, you might have the desire, but without that buy-in, that becomes problematic. You don't have the SOPs. And as far as we all know, pharma doesn't work great without SOPs. So creating those SOPs becomes problem problematic. But you can only create those SOPs if you actually know what the internal reporting structures are. And that, as, as I've sort of experienced over and over again, um, that's becoming hugely problematic because I, al I always spoke to John about this. Who else do I need to speak to now? And now do I just inform them or do I need to wait for their okay? Those types of questions start becoming uh, a real consideration. When you're dealing with patient groups, one of the things they keep uh, complaining about is, is this an actual conflict for what I do? And that becomes hugely problematic. Um, again, we're trying to synchronize and synergize different regulatory requirements from all over the world. If you're engaging in true patient-centric behavior, um, is, is your... Um, lay summary that's being put out, is that considered to be uh, a pre-approval promotion? Luckily, the FDA came out, I want to say two weeks ago, and put out something around um, uh, intended use. So that question may have been semi-answered. Uh, we, we talked about intellectual property issues, and, and if you're going to actually truly bring uh, patients within the fold, let them see everything, see how the sausage is made, um, you need to start thinking about intellectual property issues and ownership issues. Uh, what if a patient says that I helped you develop this protocol uh, or I helped you develop something like this, I own, I own a component of that. 
So you need to make sure you've got that covered. And that actually goes to the next question of appropriate compensation. Should you pay patients for, um, for, for helping you with this? On one hand, totally makes sense. They're, they're giving their time. On the other hand, does that start getting into undue influence? And then um, this was a, a, men, uh, a hint that Lori had, which was um, everyone sort of talking about this tech-focused uh, innovation and patient centricity. The problem is a lot of this tech is at this moment unvalidated. Um, so if, if that's true, I, and I'll give you a, a simple thing. I, I wear my Fitbit everywhere I go and um, I can never get it to consistently match up with my uh, brother's Apple watch. So how do I know which number is accurate for the number of steps I took? And if I can't trust that for the no number of steps I took, how do I trust it for my heart rate? How do I trust it for anything more? Um, there was a conversation earlier about the use of artificial intelligence. And the truth is the FDA itself is trying to figure out what that means. The, they put out a notice, I want to say yesterday or day before, saying that let's talk about artificial intelligence. And the truth is that artificial intelligence is a little bit of a black box in that um, even the best artificial intelligence engineers can tell you things like, I know what I put in. And I know I have a result. I have no idea what happened in the middle. So, so how does that actually uh, play itself out? Um, I'm trying to read Scott's comment, but I can't read fa fast enough. And I know I'm over my 10 minutes. So Joanne, I'll let you have it back. I'm happy to answer questions. Ellen, I'm going to start with you. Do you have any comments or questions about what we've heard so far? Yes, first I would like to address the question, um, are there benefits of using AI to reduce the cost of clinical trial? Actually, th there is a company called Deep6 AI, and this company designs software with AI that uh, can sift through um, tens of thousands of medical records, um, el electronic medical records, to come up with pre-screened patients uh, with the criteria, according to the criteria that the research team could put in there. <clears throat> now, this software is extremely expensive. However, their argument is that instead of spending um, tens of thousands of dollars on nurses or, or people um, actually doing this job, you can do everything much faster, you know, with AI. So that's, uh, that's one possibility. And um, I don't have any relationship with this uh, company. I just know of them. I saw their presentation. And, um, you know, so this perhaps one step in uh, utilizing AI in decreasing clinical trial costs. And There's then, a couple um, too. Um, one is uh, Verana Health, which is in California, and it's similar to Deep6 AI. Um, Verana Health works through physician associations, so they can interrogate the data that the association pushes to them to identify the patient experience and, and really help to design a program, not necessarily to identify a program. And then there's another one around, uh, around the management of the execution of the program called SAMA. So I see it coming. Um, it's definitely becoming a little bit more mainstream. It's just how do you use it? And it kind of goes back to what I said, which is it has to come from the top and it has, there have to be the right people in the company who understand how to bring it in and integrate it. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Ellen, do you have any other comments or questions? Um, I have several others, but um, I just want to make a quick comment again. Um, I think, Lori, you, you went over some technology um, aspects of implementing clinical trials, and not only for um, patient-centric, but um, so for remote clinical monitoring as well. And I was a monitor as well. But um, uh, recently, I learned about a company called Vertrial that created a high definition live streaming glasses that actually allow uh, the uh, monitors see the site and uh, quote unquote visit the site, do um, visits um, like, um, you know, initiation visit or a feasibility visit um, without physically being present. So I think that's something very interesting and curious that perhaps, you know, we couldn't even think of even several years ago. So I, I, I'm going to be the, the naysayer here. We also have FaceTime. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I, I was on the phone late, late last night with a large network of research sites all over the South, and they've done all of their, their, their um, pre-qualification visits using FaceTime. 
Well, uh, I just thought that uh, high definition glasses for the visit. I thought it was a little bit way off uh, too, but uh, this is great. Yeah, we use technology. If anybody remembers uh, uh, computers of late eighties, early nineties, um, our cell phones can do so much more and uh, we're just going by leaps and bounds. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think sometimes it's interesting because I see people who are really technology savvy and they love all the shiny objects. Um, and the, I, I would say the, the rule of thumb would be not to get so into the shiny object if you can find something that's already adopted. <laughs> it's just a keep it simple approach. Not to put down your comment because I, I find all this stuff very interesting as well. And um, uh, Joanne, can I have one more question sure, comment for uh, Darshan? Darshan, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, Helsinki and uh, made me think about the Belmont principles and principle of justice uh, where, uh, you know, the burden should be spread and one group shouldn't uh, just share the burden and the other one reap the benefits. Do you think uh, that uh, bringing the trials into the patient's homes make them more accessible will actually, um, how, uh, what are your thoughts? And I think it, it, you know, it might be a step in the right direction to make trials more accessible and perhaps, you know, to, you know, spread uh, the justice. <laughs> but what are your thoughts on that? Sorry, uh, I had myself on mute. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. One of the things I also do is I teach bioethics at the University of the Sciences. So I talk about the Belmont principles and I talk about the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, the, one of the key pieces to consider is that I, I think it provides the opportunity, if done right, for, for uh, the, the Belmont principles and the principle of justice to really prevail because you, you'll get everyone to, be, to participate in it. Um, there has been um, some argument that it may flip the other way because some of it is technology focused and technology based. Therefore, it may land up going to more affluent neighborhoods than less affluent neighborhoods. Um, and that, uh, if, especially if you're talking about a tech-focused type of patient centricity. On the other hand, um, it, it says also, this has also sort of enabled some opportunities. One of the examples of which is, um, I forget which company, but they've been tying a lot of, uh, a few CROs have been tying up with groups like Lyft and Uber to actually get patients to the actual uh, site. The question is, what happens if you say, I don't need the Uber, you come over to me. Does that, does that technology enable more? Um, I'd like to hope that it does, um, but only time will really tell, won't it? Lovely, thank you. Uh, Daria, do you have some questions you'd like to ask or comments? Um. I guess more of a comment, and I know Lori touched on it, and I think Deshaun, and it really goes to the protocol design piece and really how to incorporate patient advocacy into that and patient experiences. Um, from, from what I know, primary and secondary endpoints have been missed um, due to this, um, due to a lack of um, patient interaction and communication on their experiences. Um, you know, I, I read somewhere that really uh, no defined protocol procedure really should it, should, it should have a reason why it's being done and relating that to the patient. Um, and again, that will prove to be primary and secondary endpoints as successful. Uh, the I've been on enough clinical trials involved and that the primary and secondary endpoints are missed. And if you, hindsight's 2020, but you do go back and you, you can see where if the patient was more involved um, in the experience and being able to identify um, their needs and their experience with their particular disease that um, those endpoints might not have been missed. So I just kind of wanted to make a comment on how um, important um, that is to really involve the patient and the advocacy groups in the initial part of protocol design. So Daria, I'd, I'd love to sort of do a follow-up on that, if you don't mind. Um, I, I'm agreeing with you 100% that patients need to 
be more involved in the actual choosing of endpoints because it's critical that um, the, the endpoints reflect what is meaningful to that group of patients. Uh, what's, what's the point otherwise? Um, the, the part we do have to draw the distinction between is um, where they missed because the results just didn't bear out, in which case, hopefully, that's a good thing and in the interest of patients themselves, because it, it means that the product didn't work the way it was intended to. On the other hand, if it was missed because of poor study design, um, that's something I think patients can absolutely help with. And, and they've, they've actually been really good, um, good advocates for that. One of my favorite examples that I've seen before, and uh, I, I'm sort of preaching to the choir when I'm talking to, to Daria here, but um, the, the, it's, it's the distinction in the case of oncology studies to go um, survivability versus quality of life. And we in industry have, in, have generally apparently, and, and the reason I'm using this example is because the FDA called it out in one of the meetings that I attended, but we've always pushed for, oh, you know what, we want increased survivability, increased survivability. And then patients came out and said, yeah, you know what, I'd rather actually have better quality of life. And that was a big mind shift for, for people who are de designing these studies. And I think that's, that's speaking to Daria's point, I, I believe, when yeah. I say that that would actually be helpful. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I think it would be positive outcome for the patient and the trial itself. When um, patients are more incorporated into the initial part of the protocol design. Lori, I see you're nodding. I know you're taking a drink there, but I see you nodding. Do you have a comment on this? Uh, these thoughts? Um, having worked in um, ICUs many years ago, quality is better than quantity. Mm -hmm. That's that was our, what I was nodding at. Um, and sometimes that isn't even something the patient's family can really diagnose. Only the patient can. Thank you, um, Magali. Would you like to Magali? Sorry, would you like to introduce yourself and make any comments or ask questions? Yes, uh, hello. Uh, as, as Joanne said, my name is uh, Magali Topham uh, and I work for Montero Language Services as the um, head of the English translation team. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the uh, speakers, first of all. Uh, it's been very interesting. It's something that I don't usually get to do as part of my day-to-day -day work. Um, so participating in this has been, has been brilliant. Um, and uh, I'd like to also thank you, Joanne, for inviting me along um, and having the opportunity to sponsor the event. I know Fritz was supposed to be here, so on his behalf, I am He's here. Living it in your capable hands. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, he has. Um, and uh, Montero does uh, really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate and, and participate in the Westchester Biotech uh, project. Um, for a European company like ourselves, um, we do believe it's, it's a project that will help us open doors on, on a more international level um, and, and really understand and, and participate in, in future projects. Um, so a little bit more about me. I joined the company in 2014 after completing a degree and a master's in, in translation uh, in the UK. Um, and during my time at Montero, I've trained and specialized mainly in IP and legal translations. So I, I work mainly with patents and, and all sort of the, the related documents that we can, we can see. Um, and I mainly work with Spanish and French and translate into, into English. Um, so that, that's just a little bit about me. And uh, just a little bit more about Montero, if uh, so you don't know, um, it's a company that is headquartered in, in Madrid. Uh, we also now have an office in, in New York. And we work and specialize with a whole range of, of different uh, documents. And uh, we provide language services from translation and interpreting. So translation being written and interpreting being spoken, um, which is a very big difference for, for everyone in, in my sector. 
Um, and we also work with localization and uh, customized language consulting uh, for, for a variety of companies. Um, we, we specialize also in la providing language and communication solutions in a variety of sectors, uh, chemistry, biotechnology, life sciences, legal, which is my department, intellectual property, uh, as well as patents, we have trademarks uh, and so on and so forth, and, and also technology and finance. Uh, we have about 50 in-house translators. Um, uh, that's where I am. Uh, we, but we also have about 300 uh, external collaborators and freelancers working for us. So we really can and do have the resources to deal with anything, basically, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. Um, and we also have what we call the a value added translation project manager, management and some consulting methodologies, which will help tailor any project that comes to us to our client and to the end user of the document that we're working with. Um, we have also um, been recognized as one of the top 20 legal translation specialists, um, which allows us to help uh, our customers reach a, a more global client and communicate across languages and cultural barriers, uh, which again, I think it means much more accessibility to information. Um, and that is my little speech. Uh, thank you. Um, that is essentially what we do and hopefully where we can help in our collaboration with, with um, this project. And I'll just share that in November, we're going to be doing a session, I think it's the 24th, it's another Tuesday, where we're going to focus on translation related to clinical trials. So kits, SOPs, you know, all the different kinds of contracts and materials that need to be developed. So much more coming yes. on all that. Yes.